to the final history. Previously, I've talked about the rise of the Assyrian Empire. In 911 BC, Adad Nirari II, the king of Ashur, got the order from the god of war to go forth and reconquer the empire that the, Assyrian had, the Assyrians had lost in the 11th century BC. Also in 900 BC, King Yi became the king of the Western Su dynasty in China, but his uncle Shao is not too happy about that. My regular disclaimer, I'm just a fan of history and not a historian. I want to learn, so if you find something wrong, please educate me. Uh, also watch the Great Civilizations of the World in 900 BC and previous decade reports. So we're going to talk a lot about Adad Nirari II. He is the king of Assyria and it's his duty to do yearly campaigns to honor Asher. This is campaigns with a non-professional army after the harvest is in. Everybody who is anything joins up with Adad Nirari and goes to war. He has three main targets. He will go to the northwest to fight the Nairi. We know very little about these campaigns. He will fight Babylonia and he will fight the Arameans who have not yet joined the empire. There are eight campaigns against the Arameans and they are not all documented. We have plenty of sources but none of them are non-Assyrian yet. His goal is very clearly to restore the Middle Assyrian Empire and I will make a video about what the army is like in the early Neo-Assyrian Empire. In 900 BC Samas Mudamik dies and is replaced on the throne of Babylon by Nabu Shima Ukin I. We don't know the circumstances and actually the only information we have about these kings come from Assyria. But Nabu Shima Ukin is not happy with Assyria. His predecessor lost the war against Assyria and Nabu Shima Ukin is gonna teach Assyria a lesson. But not yet, because in 899 BC, Adad Nirari takes the Assyrian war train west across the Hanilgabat, the land between the Tigris and the Euphrates, and its target is to go across this river and reclaim this land. Uh, this is the lands uh, that Abraham traveled through, so that's why my map talks about Abraham. Uh, taking all the lands to the Euphrates is a major target for the Assyrians. Bit Adini is a powerful Aramean state. Uh, their capital is located on the other side of the Euphrates. And we'll show a map here. So here is Bit Adini. This is their capital. Kerkemish is here. Very powerful Aramean New Hittite city. But when Adad Nirari shows up with the Assyrian army, Bit Adini immediately yields because if you yield early to the Assyrian army, you have the option of paying tribute. And we don't know what was in this tribute except to apes. And there seems to be a thing, it happened in the Middle Assyrian Empire as well, that if you give the Assyrian king monkeys or apes, he is like amazed. And older Assyrian kings have like made reliefs with the monkeys. So Egypt has gotten away by giving uh, monkeys to Assyria before. And it seems that the Assyrian king is like really obsessed with weird stuff he gets for tribute. So Adad Nirari has noted, I received two apes from Bitadini. It is unclear why these apes were so fascinating, but they were fascinating. So in 899 BC, there is a solar eclipse in China that we can date to uh, an exact date actually. And this provides reliable data to King Ji, because King Ji has documented this solar eclipse. Now, uh, this is in contrast to all the poor documentation we have. Remember, Ji's uncle Chao is plotting in the background, having evil plans against his nephew. In 898 BC, Adad Nirari goes to war against Mukuru. Remember last time, the Assyrians are fighting the Temanites, a powerful Aramean tribe, or perhaps a Nairi tribe, it is unclear. 
But Mukuru helped uh, Nuradad, the other Temanite ruler. They have two important rulers. Mukuru's capital is Gidana, and I don't know where that is located. Uh, I haven't found it, but it was a fortified city. So this is the first time, I think, that the Assyrians come up against a fortified city. And the Assyrians will become masters of siege warfare. They don't want to do siege warfare because siege warfare takes a long time. But they will bring siege warfare to a level where it has never been before. All the ancient cities of Mesopotamia are protected by great walls and think that they are invulnerable. But they are not. And Adad Nirari will win this fight against Mukuru. He takes the city of Gidana. Uh, Mukuru's fate is uncertain. And Adad Nirari also claims to invent the redoubt. And when I research what the redoubt is, I found that quite unlikely. It is very unclear to me what he actually invented, but he talks about inventing the redoubt. This is a total Assyrian victory, and it will be important because this area will be pacified for a long time. In 897, Adad Nirari or Nabushuma Ukin initiates the great fight that was coming between the two big powers in Mesopotamia. So it is the god of Marduk versus the god of Asher. Adad Nirari reports from this war against Babylon. The year is uncertain. I, th I think it was 897 because nothing else is recorded for this year. And Adad Nirari says, I sacked several cities and hauled vast booty home. But um, the aftermath of the fight shows that Babylon clearly won. And it was a big victory for Babylon because the Assyrian border is pushed back to the Lesser Saab River. Uh, we'll have a look at that. This is Asher, the capital of Assyria. And this is the Lesser Saab River. It's right next to Asher. So, and Babylon is down here. So this area is now controlled by Babylon. So this must be a major victory for uh, Babylon. And Assyria reacts to the defeat, thinking that, okay, it was too early to attack Babylon. We have great respect for the Babylonians and an uncertain peace ensues. But Assyria will look elsewhere for a couple of years because Babylon was obviously way too powerful. And it is, Unclear why Babylon could win this war. Uh, there are the Chaldeans and the Kassites, two major barbarian tribes uh, close to Babylonia. They were probably assisting the king, even though the king seems to be Sumerian. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. In India, Kuru is a strong state in the north. India is not. Nobody's writing anything down because they can't write. These are Vedic times and there are enormous problems with dating anything in India from this century as last century. So I hope I will be able to say something about India, but it is extremely hard. So please help me, tell me what I should talk about regarding India. Because India will not really enter the historical record with any certainty before uh, Persian kings invade. And that is a long time in the future. So in 896 BC, Adad Nirari goes to the final battle versus the Temanites. Nur Adad rules from Nasibina, that's on the map here. It's uh, this city with many different names, as we talked about last time. And when Mukuru can no longer assist Nasibina, Nur Adad, the Temanite ruler, decides to surrender to Adad Nirari. And he's taken captive and hauled off to Asher. We don't know what happens to him. This is a total Assyrian victory and the Temanites disappear from history. And once again, Adad Nirari goes on about redoubts, but there seems to have been no siege or that maybe there was a siege and then he surrendered. So we don't know, but we know that the Assyrians have won this battle and the Temanites are gone. In Mexico, the Olmecs are uh, doing great things in La Venta. And even though they lost their religious center at San Lorenzo, the greatest time of the Olmecs is yet to come. The Olmecs are getting a lot of luxury goods from far away. They're actually trading uh, as far away as Guatemala. 
The Mayan are hanging around on the Yucatan, being in awe of the mighty Olmecs. When people originally defined the Olmec culture, it was defined as an art style, and this fish figurine is one example of Olmec art, and I will talk more about Olmec art at the later stage. But the Olmecs still going strong, still going on from La Venta. In Egypt, Osirkon is the second pharaoh of the 22nd dynasty. He rules over a period of peace and prosperity. He has strong connections to the Phoenicians uh, on the coast of the Levant, especially with Byblos. Uh, I talked more about Osirkon in the last episode, so please check that. I made an error in a show note, not in, uh, uh, not in the videos, but in the show note, that this guy is called Osirkon the first. He's the second pharaoh with the name Osirkon, but his great uncle, Shoshenk's uncle, was Osirkon the Elder, and he was the pharaoh back in the 990s and 980s BC episodes. So this guy, the pharaoh right now, is Osirkon the first, not anything else. In 894, Adad Nirari II marches through the land. And the inscription reads, the king marched victoriously through the land. And everybody's just yielding to Adad Nirari. He walks uh, west to the Kabul River and then south along the Euphrates. And many later kings will copy this operation. Uh, a lot of people pay uh, tribute and like, oh, you are so great, Adad Nirari, please don't kill us. So what did Adad Nirari accomplish? There were other campaigns, mainly against the Arameans and the Nairi, but I have no details for them. Uh, Adad Nirari has reasserted territorial claims. He's not yet done. They don't control the area of the Middle Assyrian Empire yet. He recaptured lands from the Arameans and others. And he reconstructed the palace of Abku. And the palace of Abku was built by the Middle Assyrian Empire. It had stood there uh, at the border of the Assyrian heartland. And it had been neglected. And 200 years had gone by. But now the palace is rebuilt. And it is one of the many storage depots that uh, Adad Nirari sets up across the land to supply the army. We are not yet in the time when there are provinces and governors and stuff, but the Assyrians will invent all of that. But now at least they have storage depots where they can get more weapons and food if they need them. So this is a great triumph of Adad Nirari. He just marches over the land. Nobody, is ex uh, nobody opposes him except Babylonia, but he doesn't march there. So great times for the Assyrians in 894. In 892 BC, King Yi dies, and we don't know why he dies. Uh, there is a, something saying that he moved his capital and that maybe his uncle exiled him, but uh, his uncle takes power and perhaps even murders King Yi. And some people in Su China are not very happy with this. King Shao becomes the eighth king of the Su dynasty. He will rule from 892 to 886 BC. And we know that his intended heir was uh, his half-brother Sheng, but there was a noble called Feisi, who was in charge of breeding and training horses. And this noble was really the favorite of King Chao. He got a small fief at Quinn, and he was also chosen to be the heir uh, instead of his half-brother. That made his half-brother angry and it also made the nobles angry because they were not happy with the way King Yi had lost his power. And remember, we still have a very strong Zhou dynasty. So who is on the throne is very important for everybody in Zhou China. In 991 BC, finally Adad Nirari dies. He had ruled the Assyrian Empire for 891. Uh, he had ruled the Assyrian Empire for 20 years and really put it on the map. And that is why we think of him as the first real king of the empire instead of his father Ashadan II. I wanted to talk a bit about the Assyrians and how they choose the next king. Uh, the king title does not go to the eldest son, but instead to a son that the king has chosen to be his heir. And he has chosen to cult in Inurta II. We don't know any other sons, 
But this way of choosing the new king uh, will cause problems because isn't this like a great mechanism for causing sibling rivalry? And we'll see later how the Assyrian Empire will have problems with succession as any empire. The cult in Inurta is probably quite old at this time when he becomes the king. And um, we don't know what years people are born. Uh, we will know by the later Neo-Assyrian Empire. But we know that Tukult in Inurta has a son called Ashur Nasirpal, and he's probably already chosen to be the heir of Tukult in Inurta because his name means Ashur is the guardian of the heir. And you will find that Ashur Nasirpal will take the empire to entirely new levels and be one of the very great kings of Assyria. Uh, this line of kings is extremely old. I, I can't even find when it begins and I should probably research that. But all the kings we have talked about since the 1000 BC show, they're all in the same family. And this family will rule Assyria for a long, long time. So what's happening in Peru? The Chavin are happening, but their high point is still far in the future and we don't know a lot from this uh, era. Sorry about that. So let's go to Europe where things are starting to happen. Uh, there are the Villanovans and we'll talk about them. Greece is still in the Dark Age. And I will make a video about the Greeks and what they're up to in the first half of the 9th century BC. It is incredibly hard to find exactly what's going on in Greece at this time. But the Dark Age is still happening. Nobody knows how to read and write. But the Phoenicians are around and they travel all across the Mediterranean. And in this decade probably, they found a colony in Spain, which we'll talk more about in the next episode. This is the first colony I found, and this will start a race between Phoenicians and Greeks mainly. A, a race to colonize the entire Mediterranean. And I find it weird that the first colony of the Phoenicians are in Spain, because Spain is quite a long way away from uh, Phoenicia. And we will also find that the Phoenicians, when there is trouble in the Levant, and there will be a lot of trouble in the Levant, they look westwards. And at one point they will actually flee Phoenicia to get away. And uh, you can imagine what they're getting away from. Maybe it's the Assyrians. Uh, hint. It is the Assyrians. Uh, the new king, Tukultin Inurta II, marches through the land. I don't have a picture of him. So this is once again Asher, the god of war. Uh, nobody dares oppose Tukult in Inurta II at this stage. He marches across eastern Syria and people just heap gifts on him. Please, Tukult in Inurta, mighty king of Asher, take our stuff. And the state of Suhu on the middle Euphrates gives Tukult in Inurta some stuff. And he is very happy for this and writes it in stone. So we actually have the inscription that the cult in Inurta scribes put together because he couldn't write. Assyrian, king, Assyrian kings can't write. And the reason for that is that uh, their language is extremely complicated. And they also have to note everything in two, at least two languages, both of which are extremely complicated. And this will help the Aramean language later. But right now they are writing down stuff in ancient Sumerian languages, which are extremely hard to read and write. So what did the cult in Inurta get? Well, he got a bed and dishes made from exotic wood and a bronze bath, linen garments and purple wool. I'm not making this up. These, these, um, these things and apes are the stuff that the Assyrian, ki Assyrian kings write down. Uh, for their gift, gifts. But then, since the time of the defeat, when Babylon beat up Assyria, it might have been seven years then, the, year, uh, the dating is uncertain, but seven years ago, Babylon defeated Assyria, but now there has been triumph on triumph on triumph. So to cult in Inurta, 
marches his army to the border of Babylonia. And what will happen? We'll uh, find out in the next episode. But first we have to talk about the Villanovans. This is the earliest Iron Age culture in Italy, as we talked about last time. Uh, they have been around in an earlier stage since 1100 BC. Um, their culture seems to be egalitarian, that is everybody is worth the same. But now we have elite graves. Uh, they start to build cha uh, chamber tombs and uh, they seem to get more powerful, more civilized and soon they will start to be influenced by foreigners and we will return to the great Etruscan question because the Etruscans are about to show up also remember the Latins are in Latium uh, they are living on the Palatine Hill long before the days of Romulus who probably did not exist so next time on uh, the fan of history we will talk about the events in the 880s BC. We left the Assyrian army at the Babylonian border. We will see a new and terrible king, Ashur Nasirpal. Terror gets a new face, Assyrian policy is revised. I will release the next episode on June the 2nd 2014. Uh, these decade reports are weekly. You can discuss the show with me on YouTube or on Facebook. Um, and please subscribe, like and share because that helps me to keep going. And if you can convince your friends to subscribe to this channel, I am very happy. Thank you for watching.